Hey guys, and welcome to the guided reading for the 3-18 assignment on feudalism. If you wish, you can go ahead and follow along with this guided reading, or you can pause the video and do the reading on your own. Here we go. Feudalism, manners, and towns. If you were there, you were a peasant in the Middle Ages, living on the land of a noble. Although you and your family work very hard for many hours of the day, much of the food you grow goes to the noble and his family. Your house is very small, and it has a dirt floor. Your parents are tired and weak, and you wish you could do something to improve their lives. Is there any way you could change your life? Feudalism governs knights and nobles. When the Vikings, Magyars, and Muslims began their raids in the 1800s, the Frankish kings were unable to defend their empire. Their army was too slow to defend against the lightning-fast attacks of their enemies. Because nobles couldn't depend on protection from their kings, they had to defend their own lands. As a result, the power of nobles grew, and kings became less powerful. In fact, some nobles became as powerful as the kings themselves. Although these nobles remained loyal to the king, they ruled their lands as independent territories. Kingdoms like France, for example, were unified in name only. Knights and Land To defend their lands, nobles needed soldiers. The best soldiers were knights, warriors who fought on horseback. However, knights needed weapons, armor, and horses. This equipment was expensive, and few people had money in the early Middle Ages. As a result, nobles gave knights fiefs, or parcels of land, instead of money for their military service. A noble who gave land to a knight in this way was called a lord. This is just the quick fact section of the textbook. It talks about feudal society and how it was designed. We have kings and queens, nobles, knights, and peasants. Take the time to pause the video and maybe read a little bit about it. In return for the land, a knight promised to support the noble in battle or in other matters. A knight who promised to support a lord in exchange for land was called a vassal. The vassal swore that he would always remain loyal to his lord. Historians call the system of promises that govern the relationships between lords and vassals feudalism. A lord's duties. The ties between lords and vassals were the heart of feudalism. Each group had certain responsibilities toward the other. A lord had to send help to his vassals if an enemy attacked. In addition, he had to be fair toward his vassals. He couldn't cheat them or punish them for no reason. If a lord failed to do what he was supposed to do, his vassals could break all ties with him. To defend their lands, many lords built castles. A castle is a large building with strong walls that can easily be defended against attacks. Early castles didn't look like the towering structures we see in movies and storybooks. These great, those great castles were built much later in the Middle Ages. Most early castles were made of wood, not stone. Nevertheless, these castles provided security in times of war. A vassal's duties. When a lord went to war, he called on his vassals to fight with him. But fighting wasn't a vassal's only duty. For example, vassals had to give their lords money on special occasions, such as when a lord's son became a knight or when his daughter married. A vassal also had to give his lord food and shelter if he came to visit. If a vassal gained enough land, he could become a lord. In this way, a person might be both a lord and a vassal. A knight could also accept fiefs from two different lords and become a vassal to both. Feudal obligations could become complicated. Feudalism spreads. Feudalism was created by the Franks. Before long, the system began to spread into other kingdoms. In the 1000s, Frankish kings introduced feudalism into northern Italy, Spain, and Germany. Feudalism then spread into Eastern Europe. Feudalism also reached Britain in the 1000s. It was brought there by a French noble named William, who was the Duke of Normandy, a region of northern France. In 1066, he decided to conquer England. This conquest of England became known as the Norman Invasion. William and his knights sailed into England soon. They defeated the English king near the town of Hastings. After winning the Battle of Hastings, William declared himself the new king of England. 
he became known as William the Conqueror. The impact of the Battle of Hastings and William's reign was enormous. Britain and Northern France united politically. The British people were now ruled by a foreign government. French became the language of the government. As a result, French words entered the British vocabulary. To reward his knights for their part in the victory, William gave them large estates of land in their new country. This was the beginning of feudalism in England. After he came to power, William needed money to fund his army. He created a survey of his new kingdom to see what taxes he could collect. This survey became known as the Doomsday Book. Today, it gives historians a better understanding of England during the Middle Ages. The manor system. When a knight received a fief from his lord, he needed a way to farm it. Knights were fighters who didn't have time to work in the fields. At the same time, peasants or small farmers needed to grow food to live. Very few peasants, however, owned any land. As a result, a new economic system developed. Under this system, knights allowed peasants to farm land on their large estates. In return, the peasants had to give the knights food or other payment. The large estate owned by a knight or lord was called a manor. In general, each manor included a large house or castle, pastures, fields, and forests. It also had a village where the peasants who worked on the manor lived. Take a moment to pause the video and explore this life on a manor visual. Peasants, serfs, and other workers. Most medieval lords kept about one-fourth to one-third of their land for their own use. The rest of the land was divided among peasants and serfs, workers who were tied to the land on which they served, or lived, excuse me. Although they weren't slaves, serfs weren't allowed to leave their land without the Lord's permission. Serfs spent much of their time working in their Lord's fields. In return for this work, they got a small piece of land to farm for themselves. They also received their Lord's protection against outlaws and raiders. The lives of serfs and peasants weren't easy. Farm labor was hard, and they often worked in the fields late into the night. Men did most of the farming, Women made clothing, cooked, grew vegetables, and gathered firewood. Even children worked, tending sheep and chickens. Most manors, in addition to peasants and serfs, had several skilled workers. These workers traded their goods and services to the peasants in exchange for food. Lords wanted the people who lived on the manor to produce everything they needed, including food and clothing. Manor Lords the lord of a manor controlled everything that happened on his lands. His word was law. The lord resolved any disputes that arose on the manor and punished people who misbehaved. He also collected taxes from the people who lived on his manor. As you would expect, manor lords and ladies lived more comfortably than other people on the manor. They had servants and large houses. Still, their lives weren't easy. Lords who survived diseases faced the possibility of being killed in war. Women in the Middle Ages. Regardless of their social class, women in the Middle Ages had fewer rights than men. Women generally had to obey the wishes of their fathers or husbands, but women still had important roles in society. As you have read, peasant women worked to support their families. Noble women also had duties. They ran manor households and supervised servants. Women governed manners when their husbands went to war. Some noblemen, so, some noble women, like the French woman Eleanor of Aquitaine, had great political power. Other women who wanted power and influence joined the most powerful of institutions, the Christian Church. You can pause the video and read a little bit more about Eleanor of Aquitaine if you are interested. Towns and trade grow. In the Middle Ages, most people lived on manors or on small farms, not in towns. As a result, most towns were small. After 1000, however, the situation began to change. A process called urbanization began to take place. More people began to live in certain areas. As a result, some towns became big cities. 
At the same time, new towns appeared. What led to the growth of medieval towns? For one thing, Europe's population increased, partly because more food was available. New technology helped farmers produce larger harvests than ever before. Among these improvements were, was a heavier plow. With this plow, farmers could dig deeper into the soil, helping their plants grow better. Another new device, the horse collar, allowed farmers to plow fields using horses. In times past, farmers had used oxen, which were strong but slow. With horses, farmers could tend larger fields, grow more food, and feed more people. Towns also grew because trade increased. As Europe's population grew, so did trade. Trade routes spread all across Europe. Merchants also brought goods from Asia and Africa to sell in markets in Europe. The chance to make money in trade led many people to leave their farms and move to cities, causing cities to grow even larger. In time, the growth of trade led to the decline of feudalism. Knights began to demand money for their services instead of land. At the same time, serfs and peasants left their manors for towns slowly weakening the manor system. The resulting growth of towns had several effects in medieval Europe. Workers began to focus on making or selling particular types of goods. This process is known as labor specialization. Over time, groups of specialized workers formed associations called guilds. For example, a town might have a baker's guild and a blacksmith's guild. The guild system helped address changes in the economy. Often they dictated pricing for products and set aside standards for quality. Guilds also influenced town government, influenced town government to benefit the interests of their members. At this time, you are welcome to pause the video and read the summary and preview, as well as take a look at the questions.